And we're back on uh, Breaking Batch. We've got our guest, Stephen Greenberg, on the uh, telephone with me. How you doing, Stephen? I'm doing well, John. How are you? Uh, good. You know, following in your father's footsteps, and I'm sure you've heard that a lot. Your dad was the uh, WFMJ sports director, and everybody still remembers Art from 72 through 76. And a former guest on this program. Is it easy for you? Let me ask you. Say again? Is it easy for you to follow in dad's footsteps? He, he, no, my, my dad is, he, he's different than I, he is the, the big, powerful speaker, mm-hmm. likes to be on TV, likes to be on the radio. I, I like to be the behind the scenes guy, so we're, we're a little different in that way. Let me ask you something, Stephen, because I'm about to be educated. When I was a kid, I collect so many sports cards. You've been doing it for about 15 years with your own company, Greeny Sports Cards. How did your love of sports cards all come about for you? Well, that, that's because of my father, you know, with, with the sports and growing up and him working for the Browns. And, you know, so I didn't have a choice. I had to like sports, right? <laughs> yeah, absolutely. So, you know, watching all the games, going to the games, and then obviously buy, buying the cards. You know, he would buy me packs of cards, and we'd collect and put the sets together and mark off our checklists. And, you know, growing up, I always did that. And one day I, I, I must have sold a card somewhere. I'm like, you know, and I, and I, it just kind of evolved from that. And I, I went to college, forgot about them. And when I got out of college, I, I got a job. And after wearing a shirt and tie for a while, I was still selling cards on the side. I'm like, you know, I could, might be able to do this. And that's what happened in 2006. I, I decided to stop wearing a shirt and tie. And you're still doing it. And so this is the sole source of your income currently, just uh, buying and selling cards? That's it. Wow. It, it, that I, guess, it. I guess the first thing I would ask you is, it's a passion of love, certainly, because now you love cards, and you said Dad influenced you to that. But even more importantly, is it profitable? Is it livable? Is it a you know makeable wage for you? Well, knock on wood or whatever you, you have around there, you know, since 2006, I, I we have four Formica. A resume. For Micah, sure. I, mm-hmm. I have not. I have not updated my resume since 2006. Wow. So, uh, you know, it's 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 doing okay. You know, I, forget about what's happening right now with the, the corona and all that. It's terrible. But it, as long as there's sports, p- people are going to collect cards. So where does uh, people find cards at? Let's say you wanted to become, you're an amateur in sports collecting. You, do you go to garage sales? Do you have a grandpa that has cards up in an attic somewhere? And I got to tell you an unbelievable story about my own father at one point and myself uh, about when I collected cards. But where does somebody begin if they want to collect cards? And I had imagined too, uh, Stephen, that you'd have to watch your budget somewhat. You, you can't go crazy right off the bat and say, it, I need uh, my Michael Jordan 1986 rookie flare card. No, no, not everybody can, can buy that card. I can imagine. But yeah, I mean, there's, there's, there's everywhere. There's, there's brick and mortar card shops. There's sure there's garage sales, you know, uh, you'd love to find somebody that has cards up in their attic that could be hidden gems. Um, but uh, I'm on the internet, you know, I, I sell on Facebook, you know, I've had a, a group. I have a guy that works with me, big Steve, we call him. Uh, he lists, uh, I don't know, a couple hundred cards on, on our Facebook group that has 4,000 members and we have weekly auctions. You know? I've got to ask you about this too. When I was a kid and cards and it would have bubble gum residue on it. And the bubble gum was always stale. I remember that, but <laughs> man, you know, you go through your, you know how many cards they gave you, 10 or whatever, and, and I'm so old that they, they would, you would pay a nickel or a dime for them. But, man, to get that one card and that player, and you'd have a team checklist and you'd check it off, that you've been waiting for that card and you'd stare at it for hours. It had to be, you know, it's just an amazing experience, and I, I'm sure that still holds true to this day. But in terms of cards, condition is everything. And even so, from a manufacturer's standpoint, how they're cut, are they pristine? If they're off-center, that affects the value of the car, does it not? It always did. Oh, absolutely. Absolutely. You know, the, the centering is a big deal. The edges, the corners, yeah, of course. But, you know, back when, when my father was a kid collecting cards, 
you you played with them, right? They were a game. They were toys. Mm-hmm. So I used to put them on my uh, you know my bike yeah, with with the sure. clothespin and pretend I had a motorcycle. I'm not lying. I mean, yeah, I well, I probably had a Mickey Mantle working card. How do I? No, I'm kidding. Well, you could have. You know, I'm not that old. I mean, well, that's fine. Uh, but in in 1952, there there was no shortage of that card. You know, the 1952 Mickey Mantle. They're, they're out there. If you want one, you can go buy one. How much? Uh, well, and then now we're talking this different thing. I mean, you can you can buy a very poor condition one for eight thousand dollars, which is a lot of money. I'm very well aware, but it's it, it's not like you can't get them. And, and Mickey Mantle, two uh, two cards uh, strike prominence within the collecting community. The fifty two Mantle tops card. Uh, I read somewhere where it could go for as high as three million dollars. I don't know. And the fi- and the fifty one Mickey Mantle uh, Bowman card that's uh, that could collect as much as a million dollars. Mickey Mantle was uh, highly coveted as a card. Yeah, and that's that's where you get into the condition. You know, those cards, you know, if nobody played with that card in 1952 and it was right out of the pack and perfectly centered, yeah, sure, you can get that much money. Let me run down a couple of cards for you I just took note of. Uh, that Michael sure. that Michael Jordan rookie flare card, what's that go for? You know, we can get into the, the topic of grading, and maybe we can do that on a totally different show. In, but in grading, it's Mike, it's a, that's subjective grading, right? I mean, it's somebody's well, opinion. It, it, it is correct, but there's there's two companies, and let's do it real quick, PSA and Beckett. You need to get your Michael Jordan rookie card graded before you can sell it. People need to know what condition it's in. And, you know, you grade on a 1 to 10 scale. You know, a, a 10 is thirty, forty thousand dollars $40,000. No kidding. $20,000. But it's, it's so hard to get a 10. That's not, you don't, it, it, they're not giving out on every street corner. You know. I, I can imagine. Uh, 1963 Pete Rose rookie card. That fetches some big money. 68 uh, tops Nolan Ryan with the Mets. And my buddy John Ross, I, I swear, I worked radio with him in the early 90s. He said that his dad left him a bunch of cards up in the attic. And he goes, and I remember he come to me and he goes, and Batch, I got a Nolan Ryan rookie card with the New York Mets back in uh, 68. You know, yeah. and it was preserved in an attic. So I'm sure he came into a boatload of money at that time. Could be, yeah. Nolan Ryan with Jerry Kuzman on there. Mm-hmm. Yep. And you look at the some of the other cards, too, the Babe Ruth. You always hear about the 1909 Hannes Wagner card. That goes for multi-millions of dollars. What's the rarest card that you've come across in your 15 years in the card oh, okay. uh, business with Greeny Sports Cards? You know, nowadays, starting in, like, the late 90s, they'll have specialty cards or chase cards that are actually serial numbered. So, you know, you can find cards that are numbered one of one. It's the only card produced of, of that specific card. So r- rare is a relative term now for cards. You know, um, you know, they have cards numbered to five, numbered to ten, numbered to a hundred. You know, back in the day, you know, you wouldn't know how many cards were printed of, you know, a 1982 mm-hmm. Topps card, you know. So... The rarest card, that's, that's Im- almost impossible to know. You know, I, I, don't, I don't have a, a Honus Wagner, no. Are there cards that to this day, and having done it for well over a decade, that Steven Greenberg still covets, I would do anything to get this card? And you can't be crazy either. You can't, say, you can't sit there and overpay for a card just because you've wanted it Absolutely. for so long. You know, it's, it's, people ask me all the time, you know, what, what do I collect? And up until recently, I don't, I don't really collect cards because it's a business. I enjoy them. I love them. I don't collect them. But now, any LeBron James card I buy, I don't resell. I just stick it in a box. I just I, I like to, I guess, collect LeBron James cards. Wow. Amazing. Yeah. And, yeah. and I imagine that's going to hold even more value as time goes. So how does somebody sit here and they know that they have a valuable card and risk the temptation of cashing it in, just holding on to it, holding on to it, holding on to it as it increases in value. That's tough as you begin to age and you you might come into a position like now with the corona and all this unemployment stuff going on where you need the funds and you need the money, but you got this card sitting there that 
Well, if you just be patient and you wait, it might be worth far more in the future. Yeah, I mean, that's, that's the stock market, right? Mm-hmm. You know, uh, LeBron keeps winning and winning. His cards go up and up. You got a, a player, you know, whose team, like, let's just take Aaron Hernandez from the, the Patriots. His okay. cards were hot for a while. We know what Aaron Hernandez did. Oh, yeah. Obviously, his cards go down, you know. So it's like the stock market, up and down. You know, when do you sell? I wish we knew the answer every single time. What's a philosophy in card collecting that if you could pass along to somebody that maybe has a collection of cards? And by the way, I've got to tell you, I collected cards in the 70s, and I, I could kick myself about this. We're talking to Steven Greenberg. We're talking sports cards with Greeny Sports Cards. He's been doing it for 15 years. I used to, and this starts in the late 1960s, and I, I would love it. I would get 10-pack of cards because, really, you can get 10-pack of cards then for about a buck, maybe less. And I would open them up, and, man, it was just so exciting seeing that player or whoever you wanted. But I would collect I'd put rubber bands on all my cards. I would separate them by teams, uh, team checklist, and check them off. And then I'd throw them in these huge cardboard boxes. Sometimes the neighborhood friends that were also into sports would come over, and he'd bring his box over, and we would trade cards and swap over there. But it was such an exciting time. But sometime along the transfers and the moves in my own personal life through childhood, I lost them. I don't know if I voluntarily surrendered them or what happened to them, but I can kick myself about that now. Now, I will tell you this, Stephen. I do have a couple cards from the early 70s, and I don't think Fred Chicken Lake Stanley is going to bring any value to me, sadly. <laughs> <laughs> that's, that's about all I've got. Maybe Lou Camilli, they used to play for the Indians. I don't know, but I, I've got these cards that mean nothing, but I can still kick myself because I should have held on to them. Well, they mean something. They may not hold monetary value. But they mean something, and that's what I tell people. Don't, don't collect the cards for the money aspect of it. Buy them because you like them. Mm -hmm. You know? I mean, that, that's, that's the collecting part of it. Not, not everybody can make a business of it. You know? I, I have. I have a lot of friends that have. Um, but not everybody can do that. So you buy them and you collect them because you like them, whether you want to just collect a player or a team or the college that you went to, anybody that turned pro from there, you know, collect them because you like them. And then in the 50s, that's when my dad collected cards. And he told me before his passing in 2017, one of the biggest regrets in his life was that when he was a kid and he said, John, he goes, Johnny, I had Mickey Mantle cards. I had the rookie card. I had all. I said, Dad, you'd have never held on to it all that. You would have cashed out a long time ago. But my grandpa got upset with him as a father and burned all his cards up one day. And he said, I could still watch my cards going up in smoke. And I had thousands and thousands of cards. And he said, he never forgave him for that. So that's an amazing story. You know, I, every, everybody collects something. I collect, I collected sports cards for a while. I also collected records and music for a while. I used to get Absolutely. original label stuff. And I know, what, I know what you're talking about when you say about grading and everything, because I did that too. And now I collect sports memorabilia from past broadcasts that date back to the 40s and the 50s, and mostly oh, at yeah. my peak time in the 1970s. And even there, you grade them. But one of the things that collectors always have to be leery about is the presence of one counterfeit copies. And yep. that is an art and a science that you have to go through and know that you're not spending buku dollars on a fake. Well, that, that's why when I, I mentioned the grading earlier and, and we said it's subjective, that the Michael Jordan rookie card, for instance, is the most counterfeited card ever produced. And if you don't know the telltale signs and there's, you know, the, the, touching the paper and there's a decimal point on the back and the the FLIR logo, if you don't know what it is, I mean, you, you, there's hundreds of thousands of fake Michael Jordan cards that are passed off as original. Is that true? And that's, oh, yeah, yeah. And it, that's why you want to have yours graded by one of the professional companies to forget what the grade or the condition of the card is to prove that it's real. Now, when, you, you know? when you're looking for counterfeit to prove against authenticity, what are, what, what are some of the tips? Is it the grain of the paper, how this is made? Notice this, notice this. Is there, is there a is, systematic yeah. uh, thing in place? Um, no, no. It's, it's, it's years of, of knowing 
you know, the, the, the touching, like I said, the, the touching of the paper. You can read, you can go on to Google and you can look up counterfeit Michael Jordan. And there's hundreds of, of tips that people tell you to look for before you actually buy the card. Um, but yeah, I mean, it's just years of experience with dealing with those cards, you know, just like anything else. You know, I, I, I wouldn't know a fake car part from a real car part because I, I don't do that, mm-hmm. you know, so... What about cards that are available? I remember I collected uh, baseball. Oh, gosh. I collected football. Mm-hmm. And once in a while, basketball. But I never collected hockey cards. It, the NHL was a fourth sport to me when I was growing up. Um, but what, in terms of sports cards and everything that you have at your company at Greeny Sports Cards, what are they? Do they entail to NASCAR and so many other different sports? Oh, yeah. Yep. We, talk I, talk I, to I, me about this. What what sports in are involved with Greeny Sports Cards? I'm fascinated. Uh, all of them. All of them. I mean, we do we do the four major. We do NASCAR. We do non sports. I mean, I sell Superman cards, and you know, I, I don't get into the Pokemon, but people ask all the time. <laughs> yeah, I, I Pokemon. Don't, I I, yeah, I don't I don't carry any of that, but um, you know, we just sold some Elvis cards. You know, so we we pretty much have. I, on our Facebook page. Now, we don't sell the packs of cards at all. We just do individual cards, mm-hmm. you know, and we run, I don't know, 150 auctions every Monday night. So, like, tonight at 9 o'clock Eastern time, um, we we have 150 auctions that end, and people bid on them. And then we have another group that we just, we put out, these cards are $10 each, and we put pictures of hundreds of cards, and they, you know, pick and choose what you want. But, yeah, we do all, all sports. We do all different price points down from a dollar to thousands of dollars with, you know, the Michael Jordan rookie card, which I don't have anymore. But I think I, the last one that I had, I sold about a month ago. How much? Michael Jordan. Come on, tell me how much. Uh, Inquiring minds are dying to know. I, I got $7,500. Woo, that's all? Yeah, that's all. It wasn't a 10. No. It, was, it was a little rough. Yeah. Speaking- it was graded. It was graded but a nine. Yeah. Okay. Speaking of being a little rough and we talked about this, I I talked about how I would take the cards and you'd stack them on top of each other. Sometimes you'd flip cards as kids when you were training and then you put the rubber band on and that damaged the card. In reality, you should have some sort of plastic and put them inside and just put them away. There's something to preserving a card's value too. Can you explain that process? Sure. Sure. Yeah. They, they have a little plastic sleeves. They call them penny sleeves because there's a hundred in a pack for a dollar. So you can do the math. Um, and then you put those into a little harder plastic sleeve called a top loader. And they have different thicknesses because now cards are different thick. You know, there's a real thin, they have real thick cards because they, now they, they put pieces of, of like a relic, a jersey or a ball. They, they put into the card. Oh, wow. You know, so, oh yeah. Yeah. There's, you name it. There's autograph cards. Um, there's pieces of dirt on the cards. I got to ask you this too. You talk about cards and not wanting to be tainted or anything. Let's say uh, somebody has a 1963, a very valued Pete Rose rookie card when he came up with the Cincinnati Reds. Let's say that person uh, bumps into one Pete Rose and Pete Rose mm-hmm. said, Hey kid, you want me to sign that card? It's, it's an original 1963 rookie card. Does that decrease mm-hmm. the value? Or does that increase the value of the card? Well, years ago, I would tell you, and everybody would tell you, absolutely not. Do not have them sign that card. But now that's the cool thing to do. People would love to have a rookie card signed by that person. And then you, you put it in a, an authentic, like one of these grading card companies, you'd send it in and they would grade the autograph as authentic and they would put it in the holder. And now you have an autographed Pete Rose rookie card. And yeah, it could make it more valuable now. That's wild. So it's kind yeah, of years ago. It was that, that you couldn't do that. No way you could have somebody write on a card. But now, yeah, everybody wants the rookie card signed. That's amazing, Stephen. Thank you for being with us today. We sincerely no appreciate problem. it, Stephen Greenberg. No that was fun. Oh, absolutely, Stephen uh, Greenberg, the son of Art Greenberg. Thank you for being with us. And fascinating to look back on cards and what their value is. And I find it interesting too that. Really, if you can get an autograph on a valued card, even as late as uh, 1963, 
Are you running into a Michael Jordan? He signs the 86 Jordan rookie flick. I don't know if I would do it, but uh, it increases the value. Times have changed in the card collecting community.